welcome to Ixom's new series of monthly videos to feature our musicians of color. I'm Paul Austin, Ixom president and a horn player in the Grand Rapids Symphony. We are very pleased and honored to have Ixom musician Joseph Conyers as our first guest in this new series. Joseph needs no introduction. He really is everywhere. Whether it be as a performer, a teacher or a leader, Joseph shines his light brightly in many arenas. I first met Joseph when he became principal bass of the Grand Rapids Symphony, his first job after graduating from the Curtis Institute of Music. Since then, Joseph joined the bass section of the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and today is assistant principal bass of the Philadelphia Orchestra. When we think of Joseph, a high level of musicianship, a warm personality and a winning smile immediately come to mind. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you, Paul. That was very kind. <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> Great to have you. I, I can't think of a better first person to, to be a part of this new series. And I'm really excited about this series, too. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to be a part of it. Thanks for having me. OK, so we've got five questions. Let's fire away. Let's do it. OK, so our first question for double pace bass player Joseph Conyers. Do you recall the first time you heard an orchestra? If you do, tell us about it. I do. So, um, well, I don't necessarily remember the exact first time because we, um, my mom, she's an amateur uh, singer. Uh, she uh, studied in college, but never sang professionally, but sang in the Savannah Symphony Chorale. I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and sang with the Savannah Symphony. And um, so she would, first of all, blast throughout the house um the whether it's Carmina Barana or Beethoven 9 just blasting practicing her parts with the um uh, for the choir and then I we would go to the concerts and I would hear the orchestra live and I there was one visceral moment I could still remember the moment I have no idea how old I was or what day it was but I just remember hearing the orchestra and I said that sound is so magical it's so magical and um i immediately fell in love with strings don't ask me why but I, the string family i was i i that's where my i, I just there was a the, this warmth and this color color it's just the the i i can't fall you know all those wonderful things <laughs> <laughs> it's like seeing the rockies for the first time or seeing whatever like it, it was just um really magical and um I didn't know what role it would play in my life, but I knew at that time I wanted it to play a major role in my life, and it did. <laughs> I'm really glad it did. I have to tell you. <laughs> so our second question sort of leads from that first question. I mean, it's you already said that you were drawn to the string section. So what led you to the double bass out of all the instruments in the orchestra? So I was a, a pianist and I still play every once in a while. Uh, I started on piano and actually I used to be a decent pianist before I even picked up the double bass. Um, but the my strings teacher at my middle elementary middle school, she it was a K through 12 and she taught strings for the entire school, but she needed a bass player. So little did I know that she already has had her eyes on me. I, uh, my brother played violin and my sister played cello. My brother's older and my, my sister's a twin. Mm -hmm. And they were both in, involved in strings. And they knew she got word that I wanted to play another instrument because my brother and sister always got to run off with their friends and play in rehearsal and play in concert. And here, I mean, me playing my Hannon scales and like <laughs> by myself. So I wanted to do something with folks that I've always I was always drawn to the collective spirit of playing uh, in an ensemble. And um, she, once she got win, she put a bass in my hands and the rest is history. Um, I, I, um, I remember my very first lesson was with David Warshower of Savannah Symphony Orchestra. And from the very first lesson, I was trying to do vibrato because I was trying to, again, <laughs> capture all, the, all that I had heard and the, all that, and I just was super excited and, um, I, it, how can I say it? I um, it came. I picked up things rather quickly, given that enthusiasm. <laughs> and it's great to see you still you still actually walk the walk, talk the talk, because you do your evening name that tune on the bass practice That's right. on social media. Also, That's right. Not a lot of people put themselves out there like that. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, I, I I I mean that's a, a slightly um, uh, different path, but. 
I mean, since you mentioned social media, I've always, it was a student who got me started actually, Paul, and mm -hmm. in, in getting on Instagram. Now I'd already had an Instagram account. I was kind of late to the game anyway. And he's like, Mr. Conyers, and I posted a video here and there. He's like, Mr. Conyers, you should post videos more often. People would really like them. Mm -hmm. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. So I started doing it. And um, Paul, it's become an incredible platform mm -hmm. to connecting with folks all around the world. Mm -hmm. And I get young musicians from uh, South America, South America, um, young musicians of color here in the United States um, who are who write me all the time um, talking about how happy they are to see me, to see me represented in classical music. And uh, so, and it keeps me honest. It keeps me on my toes, Paul. <laughs> it really, when you're throwing yourself out there like that, and now I've, I've got a whole audience of folks to be accountable to. And so um, uh, it's a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship. That's great. That's really, really great. So, so our third question for rock star double bass player, Joseph Kahn, <laughs> uh, was there an aha moment when you knew that you wanted to become a professional musician? Oof. I don't, Paul, I don't think there was any one aha moment. And I'll tell you exactly why. It's because growing up in the South, um, there were a lot of people who had great doubts that anyone could actually have a career in music. Mm -hmm. So I actually got a lot of, well, I had, I can't, Paul, I cannot put it in words, an incredible family of folks who wrapped me um, in their arms and guided me and mentored me most of the outside world was telling me absolutely not and there's no way you will be successful mm -hmm. um and so and i'm a little bit of a pragmatist so those voices were always in the back of my head mm -hmm. um but i think what really sealed the deal when i was applying for colleges i never even heard of the curtis institute of music until my the summer of my junior year long story short and when I got into Curtis, that kind of sealed the deal because all the other schools I was looking at, um, there were, I was looking at doing a dual major between meteorology, that's my other you know, <laughs> weather. <laughs> other class, yes. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and music. But I, that's when it, it huh, that's when I, I felt like I made the, 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 the full decision to go all the way. And um, I think, I'll, I'll add it, it, and it wasn't just because of the music, Paul. And this is the part that I, I, as I get older, I can reflect on. It was never just the music. Everything that I did in my life, um, particularly in music, but even on the outside, was about how am I sharing it with others and how am I using it to empower others. Mm -hmm. um, my musical upbringing was yes, in classical, but I also grew up in the traditional African American Baptist church. Um, my church was located between two different housing projects in, in Savannah and our, the, the, the church, the whole spirit of the church was how are we helping people? We have these gifts, we have these resources, we, are, we have these privileges that other folks don't have. How can we make it so that they have opportunity? How can we make it so that they have, um, uh, can see the world in, in, in a new and different and encouraging and uplifting light? So it being becoming a musician wasn't only like something I wanted to do, but it was almost like by that point a calling, because it would allow me to fulfill all those things that I enjoy doing, which is helping others and being a servant uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, for others and providing pathways for young people so that they can um, achieve the same success that I've been very as fortunate to to um, achieve. How great is it that you've got that community as your foundation that you're able to build upon that? So when you knew you wanted to be able to go to Curtis, that was your moment of this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And I knew it was going to take a lot of work, Paul. I did all the practice like everyone else. Even my friends said I practiced too much, like all that fun stuff. I, I, because that, that part was important. You have to learn the craft. But I was having an ear to the ground about how can I be of service? Um, how can I help? And I realized that in, even in our industry is there's a sometimes a lack of that because the path is so, you know what it's like, Paul, the path is so direct in what we do. You practice, you practice, you practice, you take lessons, you take do auditions and then you get the job and you play the notes. And there's very little opportunity to look outside our own selves, to look outside the box. And I think 
traditionally and historically our industry has struggled with that not for, not for for some like uh how can i say some active um uh, um some active like we aren't trying to but actually because it's something that the industry never had to do or never was re related to and then when talking about issues of diversity i think diversity is important on the stage i think representation is important but more more almost more important because i think it leads to the same results is diversity of thought diversity of background diversity of opinions coming into the fold because if you bring that into our space i think by default we will then be way more open to our communities way more open into providing pathways for students who may not from underrepresented communities to be in our field mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately there's a little bit of sometimes dissonance because it's outside of the box of what the industry has always expected mm -hmm. so i love i i love having a platform so thank you to, to be able to to talk about things like this because <laughs> Is that di is that diversity of thought that's just as important uh, as the diversity um, uh, and representation um, of people on on concert hall stages? Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Great. <laughs> Got another question for you, if you're ready. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, question four. Uh, so, you've performed as a member of several Ixom orchestras. We mentioned Grand Rapids, Atlanta, Philadelphia. Is there a special concert that you will always remember? Uh, it's not one concert, Paul, because they're all so different. Um, I think in Grand Rapids, and you'll remember this, it was my first season, it was the fall of my first season in Grand Rapids, and I had just gotten contacts, so I would always worn glasses my whole life. Um, I hit a deer, which apparently is very... Oh. <laughs> You're gonna lie. <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of like a thing in, in Michigan, uh, and Deborah Henson Conan. Yes, the CBS <laughs> special, which we got the Grammy nomination for. That's right, that's right. And that all happened literally kind of within the same week. Um, and of course, there's a little feature with me and Deborah in that in that video, and it was just so much fun. I remember it was my first time starting a job and just being having that kind of energy. I was kind of not expecting, and of course, the Grand Rapids Symphony was so loving, and and it was just it's like being with family. So I, I felt like that was a great way to start the job. So. That was that's very first and foremost with Grand Rapids. Let me that, please jump in just for a second because before you got here, we didn't get a Grammy nomination. So thank you. That's right. <laughs> okay, so, hold on. <laughs> um, uh, uh, not an Exxon orchestra, but I did play with Santa Fe Opera as well for four summers, mm -hmm. and we did a Benjamin uh, Britton Peter Grimes that just rocked my world. Amazing, amazing. That mm -hmm. was that's way up there. Atlanta. Uh, Fantastic experience with the chorus. Basically, anything they did, it it's just I, to have the Atlanta Symphony with that the, the the tradition of the Atlanta Symphony chorus was always tremendously special. I remember doing a uh, Mozart Requiem uh, mm -hmm. down there, and in Philadelphia, we've done so much. Um, but I think the stunt concert that sticks out the most um, was when we. I'm trying to remember. Make sure I'm getting. I think we were supposed to open Carnegie Hall. Mm -hmm. And then there was a stagehand union um, labor dispute. Oh. And so we did not open Carnegie Hall. We did not know this until basically that morning. Oh, wow. So oh, what wow. we did is on the fly, opened up our doors to the community of Philadelphia and played a concert right on our stage in Philadelphia, free of charge for anyone who wanted to come. Mm -hmm. Paul Austin, in a matter of hours, the Verizon Hall was filled to the brim. We didn't know who's going to show up. Phil, I mean, a concert completely. And I'll never forget when our concert master, David Kim, walked out, the audience went nuts. It was like we were at a, a Phillies World Series <laughs> uh, game. And that was really, really special. Um, uh, again, not necessarily having to do with the music, but that connectivity with the community in that way. And I think the spontaneity of it, um, the fact everyone was kind of not knowing, not sure what was going to happen, just made it such a special event. Um, and I, that will, I'll, I'll always remember that moment. It was fantastic. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Wow. Yeah. Oh, final <laughs> question. Uh, if today's Joseph Conyers mm. could give a piece of advice to himself during his student days, Oof. what would that be? Oof. <laughs> hey. <laughs> All right. Um, the first thing would be keep the faith because there are many reasons to want to lose it. 
<laughs> but keep the faith because what we do is hard. Um, I would say, I might say, um, you aren't alone. I think sometimes in our world, uh, particularly as we're preparing, it can be very isolating. Uh, and I, I spoke to you even about like diversity of thought and sometimes being in certain circles, even in our own industry, we can feel <laughs> alone. But uh, uh, there are others out there who might share that same spirit. The idea is how do you connect with them um, and have conversations that hopefully can then be amplified as more and more people find out. Um, and yeah, and, and just keep enjoying the music. Yeah. All, that's, what, that's, always, that's what's always been my driving force is the music itself. Even amidst the, the, the travesties and uh, calamities of the world and the process. I mean, I, I mean we all, we've gone through this process of auditioning and re rejection and like, why? And I did my best and all, but, but the, the thing that always got at me was the music. So I would just say, keep holding on tight. <laughs> uh, and use that as your guiding light um, uh, uh, in moving forward. That's yeah. great advice. It really <laughs> So, you know, final thoughts, not a question. Yep. Uh, if you want to feel free and share anything that I haven't asked that you'd like for our followers to know. Oof. Um, sure. I think given the Ixom audience and, and the, the folks who are listening, I think I'll just, sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit on a, uh, on a, on a pedestal or soapbox <laughs> uh, um, beating this drum, but I feel like I will use this opportunity to beat the drum um, anyway. <laughs> uh, and that is, is something what I said earlier, we are very fortunate to do what we do as musicians. We have tremendous gifts of healing of connectivity, of community that we can bring to our communities. And I wanna challenge all Exxon members to think about what does that mean with their instrument in hand and what that means when the instrument is not in your hand. And if you can start to think of the world in that way, um, being grateful for all the opportunities that you have been given now as an Exxon musician, um, which is a coveted position by many young uh, aspiring musicians um, uh, uh, in the country, if not the world. Uh, how can we take that gratitude and turn it into something where we can take the, the positions that we, we've um, um, won, the privilege that we have, and use it to share it to provide opportunity for others? If we can think about that every day, Paul, I'm not worried about, I, I would not be worried about the future of our industry if that's how we think. I'm worried if it becomes myopic. I'm worried if it's about us. I'm worried about if it's about our performances. It's about, it's, it's about the community. It's mm -hmm. about the world we serve. Think about the role music plays in cultures all around the world mm -hmm. and how it brings people together. And really it's this, this, this source that uh, uh, ignites inspiration uh, um, collaboration and connectivity with all who partake in that shared experience. So Ixon members, we are very fortunate. We are very blessed. Let's use that uh, to make the world a better place. Wonderful. And with that, we wrap up our conversation with Ixon musician Joseph Conyers. Joseph, thank you so much for sitting down today with Ixon so you can get to know you a little better. It's, it's been My a pleasure. pleasure. Really good to see you. <laughs>